But today's scripture is Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 7. We've been in the Ten Commandments for a little bit here, so we will continue here with the third commandment. Exodus chapter 20, 1 through 7. And for those of you who are new to us or just joining us recently, uh, anytime you see the capital L-O-R-D, as we'll explain uh, more in detail later, you will hear me read Yahweh instead of Lord, because that is what is written in Hebrew. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 7. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am Yahweh your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, Yahweh your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments." You shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain, for Yahweh will not leave him unpunished who take his name, who takes his name in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How would you feel if Beyonce and Jay-Z, if you don't know Beyonce's Houstonian, was so thrilled with the work that I'm doing here in this great city of ours that she was like, you know what, you're such a good thing for the city, I'm gonna give you a gift. And she decided to give me a Lamborghini which is a really fast and really expensive car, right? Or the pair of the most exclusive shoes or the most ultra-exclusive designer bag, whatever your fancy thing is, right? Imagine that they gave this to me or to you. And because I was afraid of ruining it, I kept it in my garage and never touched it. It just sat there underneath the cover. I didn't even want to get dust on it. Most of you would probably look at me and say, what a waste. Give it to me. I'll drive it. A car like that isn't meant to be looked at. It's meant to be driven. Take it to the Autobahn in Germany where there's no speed limits and go for it, right? I think all of us would indeed perhaps agree with this idea unless maybe it's yours and you think like I do that it maybe should be kept in pristine condition. But I think most of us would agree. Things like that ought not be wasted, right? A gift like that should be fully utilized. It should be fully taken advantage of. And the reason why I mention that is because, believe it or not, this third commandment, that we shall not take God's name in vain, at the heart of it is this idea that we do not waste the most precious gift that God has given to us. You'll see this on the screen. The kind of the tagline for today is, God speaks this commandment because God does not want us to see us waste a precious gift. God is telling us, I've given you one of the greatest gifts you can ever receive. Don't let it be for nothing. Don't waste it. And you may have noticed, if you've been here for this series, right, that in this series and in general, again, I said it earlier, that whenever you see the capital L-O-R-D in Scripture, we here say Yahweh, which is God's personal name. It's either spelled Y-A-H-W-E-H or capital Y-H-W-H, depending, but it's Yahweh either way. And the reason is because this is the actual word that's written in the Hebrew in the original text but also because the Jews, for lots of different reasons that we'll get into today, they were so afraid of using this name because they misunderstood this commandment that they just stopped saying the word altogether and they replaced it with this word, Lord or God or Adonai. Again, we'll get into more of that later. And this idea may seem interesting to you, but it's not too far from the idea, right? And I call this commandment the contemporary sex, the the, not oh my God, but oh my gosh commandment. It's like this, it's like, hey, Did you see so-and-so's, like, Insta? Like, oh, my God. And then some of your friend goes, your really Christian friend on the side goes, no, 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 not oh, my God, oh, my gosh. Oh, sorry, sorry, oh, my gosh. Like, I can't even, like, something like that. Or maybe, like, hey, did you hear, like, did you hear about Cardi? I don't know why I chose that name. It's just because I know no one here named Cardi. Like, and someone goes, like, oh, my goodness, like, hashtag OMFG. And then someone goes, for Christ's sake, Elsa, like, God, you're so insensitive. Jesus, like, have some sense. And this one will be like, don't use God's name in vain. You did it like four times, right? Growing up, for me, this is what this commandment meant. It was a commandment against profanity or cursing, and now perhaps the anti-hashtag OMFG commandment type of thing. But if you think about it, It's really just silly in a lot of different ways or foolish because if you were here for the first two commandments, right? The first commandment warns us that we ruin our lives by worshiping false non-gods, big deal. And the second one tells us that we ruin our lives by worshiping the true God the wrong way. Again, a big deal. And then to follow those two commandments up with the, hey, don't say, oh my God, but rather say, oh my gosh, or oh my goodness, seems just rather just stupid on some sense, like not a good follow-up, right? 
But of course, as you are, you know, understanding from my tone of voice, that's not what God is getting at, okay? And here's what God, here, here is what God is getting at. And consider this, the quote is on the uh, screen. Using God's name in vain to express anger or frustration or surprise, the oh my God kind of a thing, is the least offensive way the third commandment is broken. It turns out that people who know the God who has a name break the commandment more than the people who do not know the God who has a name but use the name in profanity. It's basically saying the people who don't know that God exists, who run around going saying, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, are breaking it way less offensively than those of us who know that God has a name and aren't using it properly, as it were. Which means then, one, we're all breaking this commandment. That's very clear. But the second is that there are ways that we are breaking this commandment that are far worse than hashtag OMFG, but the worst part is we don't even know that we're doing it. Because the most offensive way to break this commandment is to waste the precious gift that is God's name, a gift he's given to us to utilize. God's gift, his name, in many ways, is way greater than the Ferrari that Beyonce quote-unquote, hypothetically, can give to me. Which means, again, if you've been here for the series, then utilizing God's name is going to help all of us protect and enhance the life of freedom that God has won for us and for the Israelites out of slavery. So three questions for today. And then the main one that we're asking throughout the series. Okay, three questions. That'll be on the screen. One, what's in a name? Right? Why are names so important? Two, what's in God's name? Right? Like, what specifically does his name mean? Three, how are we wasting God's name? And of course, the main overall question, how does wasting God's name, taking it in vain, right, ruin my life? Or how does using it well help protect and enhance my life of freedom? Let me give you a little bit of background and context of the thing, because we like to do this all the time. The word vain in the commandment literally means nothing, right? Or emptiness, right? Like it says in Psalm 127 on the, on the board, right? Unless, the, unless Yahweh builds the house, they labor in vain or for nothing, right? Who build it? Unless Yahweh guards the city, the watchmen keep awake in vain or for nothing. We read that this morning, right? The word then take, do not take Yahweh's name in vain, literally means to carry or to raise or to take up, which means God is saying, take my name and use it which means they don't take my name and use it for nothing. Take it up and use it properly, okay? That's the idea. Now, let me give you a bit of a context to kind of help make sense of all of this, and this is important. The context of this commandment comes directly out of Exodus 3, and you know this story, right? A couple of months before Moses receives the Ten Commandments, Moses meets God at a burning bush. You know that story, right? There's a burning bush, but it's not burning up. And then God speaks to Moses, and they have this really cool conversation. In and through the conversation, Moses asks for God's name. And God tells him that his name is I am who I am. And if you read that I am who I am in Hebrew, in it is included the name Yahweh. And this is important because up until this point in Scripture, every single leader, every single person in the Bible, right, to whom God had revealed himself to, all of Moses' ancestors, he used the title El Shaddai. You'll see it on the screen. It means Almighty God. The word El, as it says on the screen, means God, and Shaddai means Almighty. Almighty God, El Shaddai. Okay, but Moses in this conversation that he's having with God in the burning bush, right? Basically, God is like, I need you to go and rescue my people. I need you to go and do this big thing. And then Moses is like, okay, cool. Well, not cool. Well, you know, he has a whole like, I don't even know how to talk. I got speech impediment. I don't know what you want me to do kind of a thing. But he goes, okay, cool. But who do I tell the Israelites that sent me? Who do I tell them has sent me? And then God says, tell them that the I am, the Yahweh has sent you. What basically God is saying to Moses is this. I'm going to win for you a new life of freedom outside of slavery. But when I do, you will need to know that my name is Yahweh, which they didn't know before up until this point. And more importantly than that, you need to know my name. I want you to call me by my name, Yahweh. Now, you might be saying, okay, Pete, cool. Like, what is the big deal? Well, let me tell you. First, first question, what's in a name. Why, why is names so important? In those days, unlike today, names carried a much greater meaning than they do today. They didn't name kids Apple, or the best one yet, they didn't name kids North, as in Kanye West's child, Northwest. I, I, I can't get over that one. I, I just can't. I, I can't. 
Northwest here, I can't, I just can't. Even my name in Korean, if you don't know, is Uram, right? And the name Uram in Korean means like Uram Hada, which is a basic way of saying like very like majestic and mighty, right? My dad lucked into it because he thought I was going to be a girl and was going to name me Poram. But then when I came out and I was a dude, he was like, oh shoot, Uram. And then just kind of lucked out, literally lucked out that I happened to be 6'2", 185 pounds. So quote unquote in the Korean, you know, I'm a big person for a Korean. So like, you know, I'm Uram Hada, I'm like big. So my dad lucked into that one. But name have meanings. If you look in scripture, right, you'll see it on the screen, right? Uh, the name Nabal, right, means fool. And if you go read 1 Samuel 25, you'll see how much of a fool he is. The name Eve means mother of all the living. Very fitting. And the name Isaac, we got a bunch of Isaacs in here. It means laughter. And if you don't know the story, it's when God tells Abraham, a very old Abraham and a very old Sarah, that they're going to have children. You know what they do? They laugh. Ha ha! Like, good one, God. So then when they actually had one, they named their son Isaac because they laughed at the idea that they could have a kid, hence Isaac. So all the Isaacs in the room, your name means laughter. Good for you. But names, as it were, and you know this, you just don't realize it, were name. Names are a way for people to exert power over another. Names in our society and culture throughout human history are a way that you give people a hold on your life, a particular power in your life. Let me read you this quote by Fred Buechner. He says this, B-U-E-C-H-N-E-R. It is my name. It is pronounced Beckner. If somebody mispronounces it in some foolish way, I have the feeling that it is me who is foolish. If somebody forgets my name, I feel that it is I who am forgotten. There's something about it that embarrasses me in just the same way that there's something about me that embarrasses me. I cannot imagine myself with any other name, say Held or Merrill or Havlicek. If my name were different, I would be different. When I tell somebody my name, I have given him or her a hold over me that he or she did not have before. If he or she calls it out, I stop, look, and listen whether I want to or not. Ooh, that's so true, right? I, in the book of Exodus then, God tells Moses his name is Yahweh. And God hasn't had a peaceful moment since. For God to give us his name and his direct name is for him to say, I want to know you and you need to know me. More importantly, I want to have a relationship with you. Here is my name. Don't call me by my titles. Call me by my name. Who do you know in life? that you are really close to, of which you don't call by a name or your own personal name that you have that no one else calls them by. Funny story, when you have kids, for a little while, they think your name is literally Appa in my sense, or Daddy. They don't realize you have an actual name. So when you go, what's Appa's name? They look at you, Appa. No, you know, like, and then when they learn that your name is Pete, they go, who, Pete? You know, they do that thing. Right? It's why in Exodus, chapter 3, verse 15, God says on the screen, This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Names are a big deal. Bad joke, but you know when a guy is trying to get a number, he wants the name along with the number because a number without a name doesn't mean anything, right? Can you imagine calling and be like, oh, hey, you know? So names are important. But number two, then what's in God's name? Specifically, what about God's name is important? Okay. Most translations of the English Bible, you'll see it on the screen, say L-O-R-D, capital Lord, rather than Yahweh, because the Jews did this, right? In the Korean Bible, right? Again, do not take the name of the Lord or Yahweh your God in vain. Interestingly, the Korean Bible doesn't have the word Chuyo or Chunim, which is a Korean word for Lord. It has Yehoah, which is, if you can hear it, Yehoah, Yahweh, right? It's interesting. So the Korean Bible does that way better than the English Bible, all English Bible, interestingly. But... The word Lord, you'll see it on the screen, is the English translation of the Greek word kyrios, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Adonai. All of those things just mean God, the title, God. Right? It's like my wife, Christina. If you've ever heard me talk about Christina, my wife, you'll always hear either my wife, Christina, or Christina, my wife, because I don't think she'd be appreciative of me going around calling her just my wife. Like, that's all she is in life. My wife. No, no, no. She has a name. Her name is Christina, just like God, has a name and wants to be called by that name. It's why, interestingly in here, maybe to some of you it's really weird because we're Korean. This is a kind of a Korean thing I wish to kind of semi-absolve. But it's why in here I don't mind if you just call me Pete. Because that's my name. 
I don't really even like the Korean tradition of the Pastor Pete, the PP, or the PG, or the PD, or whatever. Like people in Korean churches, they, they obsess over this title. The reason why is because I have a name. The only reason why I let many of you call me pastor is because I literally, you're like my kids. You think my name is pastor. So you just call me pastor. That's kind of who you are sometimes. But that's the idea. I have a name and I want you to call me by it. Why? Because I'm not just a title to you. I'm a person who loves you and I hope that you love me. God wants to be called by his name. And if you don't think that you do, you do it all the time. Every time you sing the word hallelujah, you're doing it. Did you know hallelujah is my favorite word in many ways because it's a compound word. You know how much I love compound words. It's two words. Hallelujah, you praise, and then Yah, which is a short form of Yahweh. Hallelujah means you praise Yahweh. Hallelujah. You praise Yahweh. Same thing. But what does God's name specifically then mean? Now, most scholars, right, who are way smarter than me aren't quite sure because the word Yahweh is a verb. It'd be like my name being jump, right? Like it's not, uh, I don't really know. But the word derivative is a derivative of the Hebrew word haya, which we'll see on the screen, which is the mean to be, right? I know. God's name is a derivative of the word haya. It's kind of funny. If he were Asian, he would have made fun of for the rest of his life, like, you know, that kind of thing. But anyways, the word then can mean he is, or then he causes to be. Grammatically, both definitions are possible. So then when God says that his name is the I am who I am, it could then mean I am the one who is. Okay? Which then, if you look at the Hebrew word more specifically, the I am verb is a relational term. So then the way I think it's best understood, you see it on the screen, is I am the one who is there with you and for you. Every time you call the name Yahweh, you're calling upon the one who wants to be known as the one who is there with you and for you. I wish my name was that because that's just so cool. In more nerdy Hebrew stuff, the Hebrew language doesn't have tenses, like they don't have a past tense, a present tense, or a future tense which means that confusingly they mean all three at the same time, which then means that his name is also the I am the who I am, I am who I was, and I am who I will be. So if you put it all together, his name, the one word Yahweh, I think best means this. I am Yahweh. You'll see it on the screen. The one who is and the one who was there with you and for you. The one who was there with you and for you and the one who will be there with you and for you. That's, I mean, this is God who wishes that you and I, mere little human beings, to call upon his name because he's the one who's trying to say that I'm the one who is with you, who will be with you, who was with you, and who is for you forever from the beginning to the end. No wonder God sees the Israelites and us, hears them and us, feels them and us, and therefore comes down, not just to the mountain in Exodus, but all the way down, as we saw, in Jesus to the earth. Which is then not surprising, then, that Jesus' name in the Hebrew is Yeshua. You'll see it on the screen, which literally means Yahweh to the rescue. Can you imagine if your name was Yahweh to the rescue? Dun, da, da, da. His name is literally like the bat symbol, just with Yahweh. I don't know why it's on the screen. It should be there, but maybe there's a... So then we better than understand his name, right? When then Jesus says, I am Emmanuel, God with us. God's name is a gift unlike any other. The most prized person being God in all the universe who looks at you regardless of who you are and says, I want you to know me far greater than you want to know me, if I might add. Then the last question of the day, how are we then wasting God's name? How do we take it in vain? And keep in mind, the second half of the commandment, it says, for Yahweh will not leave the person unpunished who takes his name in vain. Scary, I know. Which means that we must both know how we are using it for nothing, taking it in vain, and then also how we are not using it, which is more flagrant than using it for nothing. Okay? So I come up with three ways, my professor helped me in his book, three ways that we misuse and therefore need to properly use God's name. And this is the practical. I want you to take home and this week go home and start to practice these things. Okay? 
Way number one on the screen, the power of God's name, okay? Here's the way that we negatively use it. We misuse the power of God's name on the screen when we treat it like a magic formula. We misuse God's name when we treat it like a magic formula. When we say, in God's name, it's kind of like saying, abracadabra. You've heard that word. Or, wingardium leviosa from Hebrew, I mean from Hebrew, from Harry Potter. <laughs> I know, I do that all the time. Interestingly, it's a start, complete side note. Interestingly, Harry Potter is not as, or you know, uh, her name, J.K. Rowling, whatever her name is, right? She's not as cool. In the, did you know there's a Harry Potter spell called Avada Kedavada? It's abracadabra. Let's get a little more original, but just sorry. When you use it like this, that's what you're doing, okay? Now, people in Moses' time, unlike today, okay, thought that if you just said a god, a deity's name, you would get its attention, right, and bring your power and blessing, which is ridiculous in many ways. And for them, but it was true. The gods of their era, right, the ones that they had, did indeed respond to their name like they were genies. But God is saying, no, 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 for us, that's not what it isn't. I mean, that's not what it is, because I am not a genie, God says. You can't conjure me whenever you want to. I'm not like that. Now, you might think that this idea is antiquated and ridiculous, like it's old school news, but we do this all the time. If you've ever heard someone say, like, I swear to God, same thing. Or, I swear by God's name to say the truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God, which is what people do in court. That's the same thing. Interestingly, when Jesus says in Matthew 5, 33, 37, he says, don't swear by anything. He says, just let your yeses be yeses and your noes be noes. He's saying, you don't need to bring my name into it. Just swear by an oath. Just say yes or no. Right? We use it like it's some sort of thing that gives us power. Or this is, sorry, but this is again another Korean thing. Many of you who pray and say the word Father or Heavenly Father or Lord more times than you actually say other words in your prayer, Father God, I thank you. Father God, I thank you for this. Father Lord, I thank you for this. Like that, in many ways, is using his name as a way of, I don't know what. Do you have a conversation with anybody else? In the, do, you ever, do you talk to your mom like that? So mom, I have a question, mom. So mom, I have a question. Yeah, you said this, mom. Yeah, you said that, mom. So can I do it, mom? Yeah, you can do it, mom. Yeah, so mom, you're right, mom. You're... That's the way our prayers sound. This is bad. If you ever listen to somebody pray and you hear that, that's what it sounds like, right? You don't ever constantly repeat someone's name. You speak to them. So we misuse it, first of all, when we treat it like it's a magic formula. But the positive of the power of God's name is that God's name makes things happen. You'll see it on the screen. Because God's name is authority and power. Scripture says that demons flee at his name. That the apostles and all of God, all of Jesus' disciples cast out demons in Jesus' name. This is a story that I won't get into, but I have one time encountered a living demon in a person. And the only thing that I knew to do was to say, in Jesus' name, get out. In Jesus' name, please, Jesus. In Jesus' name, get out. Again and again and again. And eventually, the evil spirit was cast out. Philippians 2 says, and at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those in heaven on the earth, and under the earth. God's name is powerful. But his name isn't some magical formula. When you take it up in the fullness in power, when you trust in its power, then you're taking his name up in honor. We sing about God's name all the time. We're going to sing about it again. What a beautiful name. What a wonderful name. What a powerful name. That's what that means. Then the way number two, okay? Okay that we don't then use or misuse God's name are the implications of God's name. We talked about God's name or names in general, how they're literally your personality profile back in the day, which means that when we take God's name in vain, right, we do so by living in a way that doesn't match his name. The number of times the church has brought shame upon God's name through the way that we live is unfortunate. The Crusades, if you don't know about it, go look it up. Or even worse, in my opinion, the church being really noticeably silent during Germany's Nazi reign. Or, in many ways, when we in North America, and mostly Christians in the church, spend more money feeding our pets than we do alleviating world hunger. Did you know that? 
Did you know that Christians on a yearly basis spend almost double the amount on feeding their own personal home pets and alleviating world hunger? It seems a little off to me. You empty God's name, its power, its character, its implication by making it nothing in the world that we live in. That's why Friedrich Nietzsche said, show me the way that you are redeemed and then I will believe in your redeemer. Hmm. Or Gandhi says, I like what I see in your Christ. It's just you Christians that cause me trouble. If God's name is given to us and we are Christians, we bear the name of Christ in our title, then when we don't act that way, we then take his name up in vain. But the positive, whenever we live life consistent with God's character, we take his name up in honor. In Leviticus 19.2, it says, You shall be holy, for I, Yahweh your God, am holy. And this is important. The reason why we do this, the reason why we gather, the reason why we worship, the reason why your yags do the things that you do is because you become, no matter what, take it to the bank, you become like the gods you worship. Period. It's why the first line of the Lord's Prayer is, Hallowed be your name. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. The word hallow literally means to make holy. Okay? Make your name as holy on this earth as it is in heaven, God, please. Make your name, the name that represents love, grace, mercy, patience, power, all of those wonderful things. Your name that represents sacrifice and death, living, resurrection, all those things. Make that name and its characteristics as real on this earth as it is in heaven. It's what we pray. My kids and I, we pray the Lord's Prayer every day, not because it's repetitive, but because there's so much power in that name. Because when God moves this way and we live like him, you speak truth. Because why? God is a God of truth. Yahweh is a God of truth. When you practice justice, we had the uh, outreach team up here, and mercy and patience. Why? Because Yahweh is a God of justice and mercy and patience. When you give to the poor or the marginalized, you do so because Yahweh is a God of the marginalized. We forget that sometimes. When you enter into someone else's suffering, you do so because Yahweh is the suffering servant we see in Jesus. When Yahweh's name is hallowed, therefore, we make peace, even through brutal sacrifice. Why? Because Yahweh's greatest moment of glory is when he lays his life down on the cross for the world. You want to give glory to God? You live out his name. Be like him. Then the third way, the purpose of God's name. The negative is that when we take, we take God's name in vain, when we throw his name around carelessly and thoughtlessly. This is the oh my God section. I just don't, I don't even understand OMFG. I just don't, I don't get. When we use God's name to express anger and frustration, right? We're doing this. But worse, a lesson to all the teachers and especially the pastors in the room, including myself, we so easily will use God's name for our agenda. Or it's like when someone tells you, this is why I tell you, like whenever you talk to a pastor and he says, just do it, and you're like, why? Because Jesus says so? It's a bad answer. If everyone, anyone tells you that, in many ways, you just kind of turn and maybe walk away. They need to be able to understand, explain to you why Jesus says what he says. We say it all the time. If a pastor tells you what to do, but then doesn't tell you why you should do it or how to do it, what you should do, don't do it. It's lazy, right? It's the, your mom telling you to do something. Why? Because I said so. Well, yeah, maybe when you're little, but when you get older, it's not good enough in many ways, right? We can't just throw the name Jesus around whenever we want and whenever we feel and whenever we feel like it. We should be careful then how we use God's name, right? But as we saw, the answer isn't to not use it at all. That's even worse. To not use God's name at all in your life is more careless and thoughtless because it completely misunderstands why God gave us his name in the first place. I want to reiterate this. This is the main point of today. God gives you his name because he wants to know you, to have a relationship with you because he wants to connect with you. 
To not speak it is to fail to understand that the name Yahweh means that he is a God who is there with us and for us before, now, and forever. How, why would you not use such a name? I mean, how cool would it be if you could at any time call up, I don't know, you pick whoever, someone cool and someone really famous or someone really powerful, you just call them up. How impressed would you be if I just took out my phone and it's over there and just, I don't know, I don't know, called up James Hart and be like, yo, what up, James? You down to hoop today? Like, oh, my God, he knows James. Oh, sorry, I just did it. Oh, I'm sorry, Lord. Oh, my gosh. I've said the phrase, oh, my God, so many times practicing the sermon. Like, it's just like, it's like ingrained in my mind. <laughs> Take it away. But how cool would it be if I said, just, yo, James? James. James. You know. What up, Kobe? What up, LeBron? You know? And they actually answered. And they actually did what you wanted them to do. If you were stranded on the side of the street, and you called Beyonce, and she's like, hey, I'll come pick you up in my nice Bentley or whatever. Like, how... And the reason why I mention it is because that's what God is asking for us to do. See, the positive of this is that we take God's name up when we call upon the name. We're going to do it two or three times when we sing right after this, when we respond. To call upon the name of God is this biblical idea that happens all throughout Scripture, especially in the Psalms. We're going to read it together in a little minute. And it's the exact opposite of throwing it around carelessly, carelessly or thoughtlessly. You get to call upon the name in a personal way, a one-to-one, I want to know you because you are worth it to me kind of a way. The name of the entire universe is God who speaks it into being. You need to wrap your mind around that for just one hot second. You have God on speed dial. If you said, hey, Siri, call God, call Yahweh, you could call him. That's literally, I know it's a bad analogy, but that's what it is. But the point is, we don't ever use it. Like, you'll see it on the screen. Psalm 3-7, arise, O Yahweh, save me, O my God. Someone prayed that back in the day. We get to pray that. Psalm 5-1, give ear to my words. Hear me, O Yahweh, consider my groaning. Psalm 6, 1 and 2, O Yahweh, do not rebuke me in your anger, but heal me, O Yahweh, for my bones are dismayed. Psalm 6, 8, Yahweh has heard the voice of my weeping. Sorry, those aren't on there. I forgot them. But the next one, Psalm 18, 1 through 3 and 6, 8, listen to this. I love you, O Yahweh. Oh, my. I love you, O Yahweh my strength. Yahweh is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. Hmm. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge, I call upon Yahweh who is worthy to be praised. Amen. And I am saved from my enemies. In my distress, I call upon Yahweh. Or Deuteronomy 4, 7, what great nation is there that a God so near to it as Yahweh our God whenever we call upon him? Let's invite the praise team to come up and get ready for response. I just want to close with this quote from my professor's book. Again, I told you a lot of this stuff comes from an unpublished book he gave to me because he's cool. Um, But this is how he says it, okay? And I want you to just kind of and maybe this will briefly explain and maybe help you before I read the quote. Again, it's it's, it's kind of counterintuitive, but to my three children, I am Appa. There is hardly a greater sound in the world to me than when they wake up in the morning while I walk inside the house and they scream, Abba! Even when they're on the toilet and they're pooping and they can't wipe their own breath, they say, Abba! It's still really glorious most of the time. 
But if you scream the word Appa, I wouldn't turn to you because I know my children's voice because that's my name to them. What a blessing that I get to know them and they get to know me. Again, a bit counterintuitive because we're using titles, but it's nicknames. To me, my youngest daughter, to me, she's my baby. I one time called her Kara, and she says, I'm your baby. Okay, thank you. But she has a name upon which I know. No one else in the world calls her that except for me. She says, Appa, I'm your baby forever, right? That's her way of saying, I am this to you forever. No one else gets in the way of this relationship except for me and you. This is it. This is as personal as it gets. And then I ruined it. I said, I hope one day you'll find a man who will call you baby. But anyway, that's a whole other story. We get to call the almighty God of the entire universe who dies for you because you need it, though you don't deserve it, by his name. but we don't ever do it. And when you don't, this is what happens. And the quote, calling on the name of Yahweh turns out to be the highest form of honor we can give, higher than praise. Oof. For when I call on the name I am acknowledging that Yahweh is greater than I and that I cannot make it without Jesus. Hmm. And the reverse is also true. Because to never call on the name is the greatest insult. It says that I can make it without Yahweh and without Jesus. Joy Davidman puts it best, he says, Many churchgoers think of the third commandment as meant primarily to forbid casual profanity. Yet casual profanity is perhaps the least of our offenses against this commandment. We commit the ultimate blasphemy by not calling upon God at all. To which then my professor says, the ultimate blasphemy? Yes. Because to not call upon God says that we do not need God no matter what the name is. Which is then why he says, I am Yahweh your God who brought you out of slavery. I am Yeshua your Savior who claims you for my own. I give you my name. Do not let it be in vain. Church, don't waste the precious gift that God has given to you. Jesus is worthy of the name. Because he is a God unlike any other. So would you then join? I'm going to invite you to stand from the jump and join us as we sing about God's name. Call upon it. Utilize it. Give it honor. Give it power. And allow God, our Yahweh, to know you. To be there for you before, now, and forever that you would draw close to him as you draw close to his name. Will you stand and writhe as we sing together in response?